The story begins with a boy named Kazuya. He stumbles upon a thug wielding a knife, who is threatening some girls. Kazuya tackles him to the ground, but he gets stabbed and ends up dying. He wakes up in the body of a young boy, and he becomes confused as he sees his reflection in a mirror. We learn that he has been asleep for a week, so his mother Sarah checks up on him, thinking that he must be hungry, so she orders the maid Sylvia to bring him some soup. They leave him in the room, telling him to rest, and Kazuya realizes he has been reincarnated into another world, so he looks around his surroundings, trying to understand the world he's in. Sylvia arrives with his soup, which she feeds him, before trying to put him to bed. Sylvia answers his questions, and he learns that he is a three-year-old boy named Cain. He is the third son of a high-ranking noble named Garm, who has an army that protects the kingdom of Esfort against foreign invaders. He becomes excited, as he learns that he now lives in a world where adventurers use swords and magic to defeat monsters. He wants to learn magic, but Sylvia tells him that he must first learn how to write, so he starts studying, wanting to live in that world. Later, his family is surprised to find he has already learned how to read and write. His sister Rain adds that he can even do math, so they start to think that he is a genius, but he is really just a high schooler stuck in the body of a three-year-old boy. They wonder why he is now interested in studying, because he seems to be a different person, and Cain explains that he just wants to learn everything he can about the world. Garm supports him, saying that it will help him become a successful person and allows him to read books about magic and history. Sarah is happy to learn he is interested in magic, but they don't think that he is ready for that yet, saying he's too young to use magic, so he should just study the books for now. However, Cain realizes that he can already use magic, but he is having a hard time controlling it, and he tries to hide it from everyone around him. Rain realizes that he is studying about the outside world, so she teaches him about the 300-year history of the kingdom, as well as the different races in the world. After two years, the day of Cain's baptism has arrived, and they ride a carriage as they make their way to the venue. Cain is happy to see the outside world, asking his sister to show him her stats after going through the ritual. So Rain opens her status window, and Cain learns that Rain can use three types of elemental magic. Sarah reveals that Rain was granted a level 2 blessing by the god of magic, which is very useful because it determines how much magic is needed to activate a spell, and it even affects the skills. They explain that the blessing goes up to level 5, and it's given by one of the seven pillar gods they worship, as part of their kingdom's religion. They arrive at the venue, where they kneel before the statues of the seven gods, and the priest begins the ceremony, asking the gods to show Cain the path he needs to walk on. A bright light illuminates the area, and Cain is instantly transported to the world of the gods. He is shocked to learn that the gods have been waiting for this day, addressing him as Kazuya. The god of creation, Xenum, introduces himself, as Cain thinks about his weird appearance, but Xenum knows what Cain is thinking, since he is a god. The god of death and rebirth, Rhyme, reveals that his death was unexpected, because if he didn't interfere, the thug would have tripped and would have gotten caught. This makes Cain feel bad, since he died for nothing, but the god of earth was moved by his good deeds, so he was reincarnated into this new world. Rhyme apologizes, because Cain was not supposed to recall his memories at the age of three, but Cain tells her that it's okay, since it allowed him to write and use magic, and even enjoy life with his new family. The god of magic takes a liking to him, so she gives him her blessing. Xenum follows suit, and the god of war gives him his blessings, along with his swordsmanship and martial arts. The god of technology also grants his blessing, telling him to use his knowledge from his previous life to make progress in the world. The god of commerce gives him the judgment and item box skills, while the god of earth gives him some unique skills that he can use when he returns. Xenum laughs as he sends Cain back with the blessing of all the gods, and the priest states that this is the first time he has seen the statue shine with such brilliance. Garm wants to see Cain's status window, thinking he must have received multiple blessings, but Cain doesn't want to show it to them, because he thinks it might be a problem. So he runs away, claiming that his stomach hurts. He hides as he checks his status window, and he is shocked to see that all of his magic, blessings, and skills are at level 10. Cain thought that the highest level was 5, so he wonders what the gods were thinking when they gave him their blessing. He wants to hide it from everyone, but he realizes that Xenum granted him the ability to conceal his status. After that, we see him at the dining table with his family, 
where they discuss the light from the baptism ceremony. Garm asks Cain about his status, so he shows it to them, thinking that he has already concealed his status, but they are still shocked by the numbers, especially his magic score, because even palace mages can't come close to that number. Garm states that with his skills, he will be successful no matter what job he chooses, warning Cain never to show his status window to anyone, because he could be seen as a threat to the kingdom. Cain returns to his room, wondering what is considered his average stats. He sees a book about summoning magic, so he goes outside to summon a fluffy animal, but he ends up summoning a demon instead. It starts attacking his sister, who happens to be passing by, and he tries to attack the demon with a fire spell, but the demon grabs onto him while he uses a return spell to send it back. He drops to the floor and passes out, but he eventually regains consciousness and is happy to see that his sister is smiling because of his deeds. Later, he is presented to a crowd during his debut, where he reveals that his goal is to become an adventurer and protect everyone. Garm tells him that he needs to study more to achieve his goal, arranging for a tutor to help him out. We see him reading in his room, as he wonders what his tutor is going to be like. His tutors arrive, one of the tutors, Millie, nervously introduces herself, while the other one, Nina, makes a very short introduction, and Millie tells her not to be rude to the nobles. But Cain tells them they don't need to be formal when speaking to him, since they are his tutors, making them feel relieved. Garm wants them to teach Cain for three years, and they immediately begin his training. They head to the training grounds where Melly tells him to try doing some swings, but she is shocked by how skilled he is. Nina comments that he might be better than Melly, making her upset, so she challenges Cain to a mock fight. Cain charges at her, and she struggles to block his attacks. Nina asks Cain if he received the blessing of the God of War, and he admits to it as he continues his fight. Milly backs off, saying she won't be able to last if they keep up at that pace, so he should start learning magic from Nina. Nina reveals that she has a level 3 blessing from the God of Magic, wanting to start with teaching the basics, but Cain tells her that he already knows the basics, demonstrating some beginner level magic to prove his point. However, Nina tells him that he just used Unchanted Magic, when it takes intense training just to shorten incantations, so she concludes that he is a genius. Millie points out that he even used all the elements, which Nina thinks is impossible, because there is no one in that world who can use all the elements that effectively. Cain admits that he also has the blessing from the god of magic, making his tutors impressed. His tutors are shocked when he offers them a towel from his item box. They realize that Cain is just too amazing, and they can no longer teach him within the mansion, because he could end up destroying the mansion with his powers. They go to Garm, explaining the situation as they ask for his permission to train Cain outside the mansion. The next day, they leave the mansion, and Nina instructs him to use an intermediate level magic on a boulder, so he uses a fire spell, which makes the rock explode, blowing his tutors away, and leaving behind a huge crater. Nina tells him that the spell was way beyond intermediate, while Millie wonders why he still doesn't feel tired, making them realize that he has an insane amount of magic. A killer rabbit suddenly appears, charging toward Cain, but he dodges its attack and counters with wind magic. He stores its remains in his item box so that he can show his family when he gets back home. Millie wishes she had a magic bag, which functions like an item box, but it is too expensive for her to afford. Nina uses a search spell to look for more monsters to hunt, revealing the location of nearby creatures. Cain wants to learn the spell, so Nina gives him a brief explanation about it, and he tries it out, allowing him to detect nearby creatures, as well as the type of creatures that were discovered. They take out the creatures, but one monster retreats to the forest as Cain runs after it. Millie stops him, saying that the forest is full of strong monsters that attack the city every few decades, which explains why it is so heavily fortified. That evening, Cain realizes that he is already at level 8, because he has a skill that gives him 100 times experience, and he blames the gods for making him too overpowered. They go to the guild hall to look for a quest, but they come across a brawny guy, who looks down on them for being D-rank adventurers, asking them if their quest is babysitting, since they are spending time with a kid. He orders Melly to pour him a drink, but Melly refuses, and Nina tells him that they are on duty. This makes him upset, so he grabs onto Nina while his companions restrain Melly. Cain slaps the man's hand, making him fall to the ground as he squirms in pain. The man tries to retaliate, 
but he is no match for Cain, so he draws out his sword, relentlessly attacking Cain who easily dodges his attacks. Cain catches his sword using two fingers and throws him outside. His companions threaten to kill Melly, but Cain charges at them, tossing them outside as well. His tutors thank him, and Melly is surprised he is also good at martial arts, but he claims that he just studied it from some books. They head back to the forest where they continue their training, and after three years, the contract of his tutors are about to come to an end. He wants to thank them for being good to him, and remembers that Melly wanted the magic bag, so he goes to the forest to look for the materials needed for the bag. He easily defeats the powerful monsters in the forest, but a guard sees the pillars of fire that he used, and thought that the monsters were preparing to attack the city again. The guard sounds the alarm, so Garm heads to the forest with his soldiers, but instead of seeing monsters, they encounter a huge crater. Cain completes the last part of his training, and he gives them the magic bags that he made. He tells them about the monsters he defeated, and we learn that it would normally take a party of A-rank adventurers, but he did it on his own. Cain tells them that the magic bags could hold a whole mansion, and only they can hold onto it, but they tell him that it would be considered beyond a national treasure level item. But they bid each other farewell, saying they all had fun during the experience. Two years later, Cain is now 10 years old, and they head to the royal capital for Cain's debut, which is a mandatory event for all noble sons. His father tells him that their journey will take one week if no monsters get in the way. Cain uses his search ability to detect any nearby threats, and tells his father that people are being attacked by monsters three kilometers ahead. Garm orders his men to pick up the pace, but Cain knows they won't make it in time to save the people. So he jumps out of the carriage, and uses a boost spell to run ahead. Meanwhile, the monsters are about to wipe out the people, and a soldier desperately tries to protect the royal carriage. A monster approaches the carriage, but Cain suddenly appears, killing the monsters with ease, and defeating the general with his fire sword. He checks up on everyone, introducing himself as the son of Garm, and using a healing spell to help the soldiers recover, but some of the soldiers didn't make it, so he stores their bodies in his item box. At that moment, Garm arrives, wanting to help, but he realizes that the fight is over. The door of the royal carriage opens, revealing two girls, Princess Celestia and Miss Silk, the Duke's daughter. They introduce themselves to the ladies, and the princess collapses from the stress. Cain casts a spell to help them relax, making their hearts lighter. The girls thank Cain for saving them, revealing that they saw him fight from their carriage window. They start fighting over him, and Silk asks him what brought him there, so he explains that they are going to the royal capital for his debut. The girls reveal that they will also be having their debuts, wanting Cain to travel with them. As they travel, he sits between the two girls in the royal carriage. He doesn't feel comfortable in his position, so he wants to move to another seat, but the girls won't let him go. They arrive at a town, where the girls want Cain to spend the night with them, because they feel safer around him. Garm asks for them to reconsider, since it would be inappropriate for boys and girls to share a room, but the girls tell him that they are still traumatized from the last attack, so they want Cain to protect them. Cain is pressured into sharing the room with them, but agrees under the condition that the room is huge. They go to their rooms, but Cain realizes that the beds are too close together. The girls want Cain to sleep in the middle, as they move the beds closer to each other. The girls get closer to him, claiming that they are scared, and Cain becomes too nervous to go to sleep. This goes on for a few nights, making Cain sleep deprived as they arrive at the royal capital. When they exit their carriage, they are greeted by the vice captain named Gazard, who thanks Cain for saving the girls and his men. Cain removes the remains of the fallen guards from his item box, wanting everyone to recognize they bravely fought against the orcs to protect the girls. Cain is about to leave, but Gazard grabs onto him, telling him that he will have an audience with the king. Gazard takes him to the king's hall, where he meets the king. He pays his respects, and the king tells everyone how he saved the carriage by defeating the group of orcs. The king acknowledges his heroic exploits, saying that the girls wouldn't have survived without him, so he makes Cain a baron, giving him his own mansion. A noble named Corgino speaks out, saying that Cain is too young to be a baron, but the king points out that he couldn't perform the same feats that Cain has accomplished, so Corgino backs off. Cain reluctantly accepts the title of baron, and the king concludes the audience, telling him to go backstage. We see Cain in a room with his father, who comments that Cain is the first among his sons to be promoted. 
The king joins them, bowing to Cain as he thanks him for saving his daughter. Cain is not comfortable seeing them in such a position, asking them to raise their heads, but the king felt the need to thank Cain as a father. The king tells him that since he excels in both magic and the sword, and even has the blessing of the gods, the kingdom can't leave such a talented child to his own devices. That's why he is given the title of Baron, even asking him to marry Princess Telestia, while the Duke also wants him to marry his daughter. Cain is shocked, but the girls are happy, as the King explains that he will now be engaged to the two girls, because he has slept with both of them. But we learn that this was all part of their plan to keep Cain in the kingdom. They continue to pressure Cain, and he eventually agrees to marry their daughters. We see Cain in the capital church, where he prays to the gods, allowing him to enter their world once again. He asks the gods about his stats, and Xenon admits that his stats are insane, so he is probably the most powerful human in the world, asking him if he wants to become a demigod. However, he tells Cain that there are limits to what he can do alone, warning him not to test those limits. Xenon tells him that there isn't much entertainment in his current world, so he suggests using his knowledge from his previous life to create something. Cain thinks about bringing in an item that doesn't exist in that world, and Xenum agrees with his idea. Cain returns to the world, and he sees a cat girl named Parma, who tells him that she's under training at her uncle Tamani's shop. Cain visits the shop, commenting on the wide variety of goods that they have. He tells Tamani's about the item that he has in mind, drawing it out, and explaining the details to him. Tamani's likes the concept, and he thinks that he could produce it at a very affordable price. Cain wants to see a prototype, giving him a gold coin to cover the expenses, and telling Tamanis that he can consider it as an upfront investment. Tamanis accepts the task, and he assures Cain that he will give it his best. After some time, Tamanis shows him the prototype. Cain thinks it looks great, playing a game with Parma to demonstrate how the game is played, and Tamanis gets excited, thinking that the game is sure to catch on. Cain suggests that they should use a different version for nobles because he is certain that the nobles would want a fancier version. Cain wants him to mass-produce the product, giving him the funds needed to do so. Tamanis is shocked, bowing to Cain as he promises to do his very best. They take their sample to the altar, swearing to the god of commerce that they will uphold their end of the contract, causing the prototype to vanish as it is accepted. As a result, no one will be able to produce the same product for three years. Cain wants them to start selling the product in the next month, asking Tamanis to prepare an extravagant one for the royal family. After that, he makes his way home, and he is informed that the debut is about to begin, so he rushes to get ready, and leaves with his parents. Garm knows that Cain will get a lot of attention because he recently became a baron, so he warns his son to watch out for parents who want to introduce their daughters to him. They arrive at the venue, where the royal family makes their appearance. The king gives a speech about the next generation, and Cain goes to the king with his family, and he presents the game that he developed with Tamanis. The king is interested, wanting to talk to him after the ceremony. Garm wasn't aware of the game's development, and Cain explains that he needs to find other sources of income to help him maintain the mansion. His parents leave, as they tell him to interact with the other children. Cain sits with Silk, who displays her interest in him as she starts teasing him, but Corgino's son Habit interrupts them, giving Silk a compliment and expecting her to reciprocate, but Silk just silently greets him. One of Habit's friends demands that Cain show his respect to Habit, so he gets up to greet Habit, introducing himself as Baron Cain, but they think he is just a son of the Baron, so they start looking down on him. Habit thinks that Cain must be from a poor family, since he didn't even mention his last name, and he threatens to have his friends beat him up if he doesn't apologize for his rudeness. But Cain tells Habit that he is the one being rude, so they go outside, where Habit wants to fight him. Habit reveals that his friends have God's blessing, and they can even use magic. The first guy steps up, and he tries to show off, conjures a really weak fireball, which Cain easily dodges. The other one also tries to be flashy, but he just launches some weak rock projectiles. They are about to attack again, but Silk becomes annoyed, so she tells them that Cain is not the son of a baron, but he is the baron himself telling them about his impressive feats. She orders them to bow since he outranks them, and they obey, begging for his forgiveness as they leave the scene. Silk realizes that Cain has a dark side, because he let the situation drag on to make things more interesting, even though he knew that the kids were mistaken. 
but she promises to keep it a secret from Telestia if Cain goes on a date with her. At that moment, Telestia arrives, wanting to know what happened, but Silk just tells her that they are going to go on a date. Telestia becomes jealous, so Cain tells her that he will also go on a date with her. The king interrupts them, summoning Cain for their meeting, where they play the game Cain developed. The king enjoys the game, wanting to keep it exclusively between them, but Cain reveals that it's going to be made available to the public. The duke is also there, and they take the chance to remind him that his engagement with their daughters is a secret, telling him to be careful on his date. The next day, Cain is given the deed and key to his new mansion. He goes to check it out, but when he arrives, he finds it's completely run down. As he enters, the lights don't work, so he uses his magic to light the way. He checks out the rooms, but finds that everything is filthy and all the rooms are empty. But it doesn't bother him, as he uses his magic to instantly repair and clean the entire mansion. He fixes up all the rooms, and the mansion is as good as new. He gets a visitor, and it turns out to be his maid Sylvia, who is overjoyed to be working for him again, and he meets his new butler, who introduces himself as Colin. Sylvia is keen to get started right away, ordering the other maids to start cleaning, but they find that everything is completely spotless, and Cain admits to cleaning everything with his magic. Colin reminds him to go back to his family, and Cain remembers that his older brothers are coming home to visit. We meet his brothers, and they are impressed he received a mansion and became a baron so quickly. Rain wants to visit his mansion, but her brothers warn her it could be haunted, since the mansion is so run down. But Cain assures her that it will be okay. They go to visit his mansion, and they are shocked because it's not run down at all. His father finds it strange, because the mansion was falling apart the last time he visited, but he realizes it must have been Cain's doing. They are impressed with all the rooms, but his father says that it's missing some art. Cain wonders why he needs art, and Garm explains that nobles are very fond of it, decorating their mansions with things like paintings, armors, and even mounted monsters. Hearing this, Cain decides to put one of his monsters up. Sylvia suddenly screams, and they wonder what is going on. The maids are shocked, as they see an enormous red dragon, and Cain realizes he forgot to tell them about it. His father demands an explanation, and Cain says it's just a monster that he defeated. His father is shocked, wondering when he defeated it, and Cain reveals it was when he was in the forest a while back. His father tells him that a red dragon would be considered a calamity level monster, and even A-ranked adventurers wouldn't be able to defeat it. His father says that the mounted red dragon would be worth a thousand platinum coins, and Cain is shocked thinking that would be worth one hundred million dollars. They suddenly hear another scream, so they rush over to check it out. His mother asks him about the toilet, because it sprayed water at them, and it was like nothing they had ever experienced before. Cain explains that he used his magic to make it shoot water, and Rain asks him to install one in their house. Garm calls them dramatic for freaking out over a toilet, but they tell him to try it out himself. So he gives it a go, and finds it delightful, instantly changing his mind, and requesting one as well. His father tells him that his visitors will also enjoy the experience, and Cain wonders what he means. His father says that when a noble is given a mansion, it's a rule that they must host a debut party, and Cain is shocked to learn he has another debut. Later that night, he wonders what he is going to do, but Colin has prepared a list of people he needs to invite, and the things that he will need. As he checks out the list, he sees Corgino's name, and he wonders why he should invite him. But Colin says that since he is a high-ranking noble, it would be bad not to invite him. Cain wonders why the king isn't on the list, and Colin tells him that only high-ranking nobles are allowed to invite him. He thinks about preparing the food and drinks for the party, but panics, because he also needs to get a gift for all his guests. But Sylvia gives him some ideas, and he creates a glass using his magic. Most people are used to just using porcelain, so he decides to give out glasses to all of his guests. He moves on to preparing the food. Using a recipe from his previous life, he comes up with a Hamburg steak, and Sylvia finds it to be absolutely delicious. She tries his drink next, and she is amazed by its fizzy bubbles, wondering what it is and Cain explains how he used his magic to add bubbles to regular wine. Colin interrupts, telling Cain he is being called by the king. At the palace, the king is mad at him, because he never got an invite to his party, 
and we learn that the Duke has been taunting him for not getting an invitation. Kane comes up with an excuse, saying that he just wanted to give him his invitation in person, and he just hasn't had the chance until now. The King is overjoyed hearing this, and Kane is relieved. The night of the party arrives, and Kane welcomes all his guests. The Duke arrives with Silk, and they are amazed by the Red Dragon. Kane thanks all his guests for joining him, and he makes a toast. Everyone is amazed by the drink, and the Duke comments on how the glass shines like a treasure. The King arrives, and he tells everyone to just enjoy themselves. He tries out the sparkling wine, and finds it absolutely delightful. He is served the Hamburg steak next, and he finds it rich and juicy, and there is even a cheese surprise in the middle. The Queen comes rushing out, wondering what's up with his toilet, calling it revolutionary, and demanding one for the palace. The King tries it out himself, and immediately demands Kane to install one in the palace. The King compliments him on his hospitality, and all the nobles applaud him. But at that moment, Colin tells him that Corgino is arriving. Corgino rudely approaches, calling the house small, but is shocked when he sees the red dragon. He heads into the dining room, looking down on everyone else. They serve him the sparkling wine, which catches him off guard, but he pretends not to like it. He tries the Hamburg steak next, and calls it disgusting, but he can't stop himself from eating it. He demands more sauce, snatching it from Sylvia, and Kane is annoyed at his behavior, but Colin tells him he shouldn't cause a scene. But Kane has an idea, thinking things will be fine, as long as he isn't the one causing the scene. Kane offers Corgino the glasses as a gift, but Corgino demands he hand over all of his glasses. Kane apologizes, saying that the glasses are his gift to everyone, but he says he has a bigger surprise for him. Corgino gets excited, but it turns out to be the king. Corgino is shocked to see him there, and the king tells him his behavior was unacceptable, when he should be leading by example as a high-ranking noble. Corgino runs away, and Silk finds it amusing how Kane set him up. However, the king realizes that Kane used him, and he ends up lecturing him for hours. But that's 